out of Reed. Welcome to the podcast. Oh, thanks for having me. It's, it, it, it's good to be here. I'm looking forward to the conversation. I'm, I'm really excited for this conversation. I think you're such an important voice um, in, in the debate at the moment. Um, I want to take a step back to, to start the conversation um, and get your sense of how the sort of American mainstream view about race in intellectual circles has changed mm -hmm. over the course of your lifetime. Oh, that's an interesting one. Um, yeah, yeah, I think that's very interesting. Uh, I think it's um, changed and not changed, which I think is kind of uh, you know the history of the race idea since its inception, basically. And and I think that that sense of change and continuity partly maps maps onto the the extent to which the commitment. Uh, to see race is more of an ontological one than it is an intellectual one, right? Uh, so I taught, yeah, probably for the last 25 years. I think ontological is a, is a word that I more or less understood in my seventh year of grad school, but I'm still sometimes <laughs> unsure. Can you explain for listeners what, what you mean by that distinction? Oh, yeah, sure, sure. Um, uh, what I mean, I think belief in race is ontological in the sense that people are committed in, in an a priori way um, to uh, to a view that the world it, or that there are the sub specific uh, human classifications or sub populations that 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 exist in nature basically right as that um, and and yeah I was going to say like for the last twenty years plus of my career I taught a grad seminar on twentieth century race theory and one of the experiences that grad students had commonly was by the fourth or fifth week that they got really depressed because they came into the course thinking that uh, uh, anticipating something closer to a Whiggish account, right? Such that there, you know, there was a benighted past when people believed uh, that uh, races were fundamentally real human divisions, uh, and then didn't. And what they learned is that 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 the fundamental commitment doesn't really go away. That what what struggles between uh, egalitarian and determinist interests can produce is victories against a particular metaphor of fundamental difference right uh, biology culture right uh, or i mean whatever um but but because the commitment is ultimately like an ideological one uh, and that's what i mean in this sense by uh, you know but but by an ontological one um you, you know those who are in, or, 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 or the tendency to believe that such differences are real in the sense that they exist in nature uh, doesn't really get defeated, right? And that's kind of depressing until you just take it as a fact of life and then figure out that this is a struggle that that will go on because it's not because it's not even specifically just a struggle against um, a discourse of naturalized hierarchy like like race, but there are a bunch of others. Gender is one. Uh, um, feeble-mindedness was one uh, you know, during the high period of, you know, of the eugenics era, and that's one reason I like to teach that too, because that was a period, partly because it was also the period in which the race idea, uh, broadly construed, was 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 more broadly held and more firmly in, 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 entrenched than at any point in history of the species, either prior to that or or since, uh, and. For that reason, you, you can see the race idea lapping uh, in, increasingly over the boundaries of the sort of phenotypic food groups that have made up the race idea since like the mid 19th century. Uh, but um, so to go back to your question, I'm sorry, that's what my grandmother would have called going all around Robin Hood's barn to give an answer. Uh, but, but to go back to your question, I think it's changed in my life, well, so from the end of World War II, or really eh, earlier, right? Um, I guess the combination of the discovery of the Nazi death camps um, and 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 a shift from biological or, or, or from biology to culture as a foundation for explaining human difference or, or the differences in human populations uh, that began in the 20s and 30s. Uh, you, you know the emergence of, of 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 the notion of cultural pluralism, which basically turns race into culture from biology, uh, and and I can say more more about that later if you'd like. 
let's but so from the end of world war ii forward um in um respectable american intellectual life um racial ex explicitly racialist thinking uh has become you know less or more has become increasingly negatively sanctioned or was increasingly likely to be sanctioned negatively um uh, things start turning around again in a funny way in the late 60s with with, with the um uh, uh you know, with the proliferation like of ethnic pluralism again at, as a way of talking about populations um uh, and, and i mean i've argued along with my colleague walter ben michaels and others as well that 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 and actually uh the rogers brubaker uh, what uh, uh, makes a version of this argument too but a little more cautiously that race ethnos nation or nation are like all different words for the same thing basically right um so that ambiguity was always there right um and even as racial liberalism spread and became you know the dominant understanding right the classic moment being uh the publication of um Carlton Kuhn's uh, opus, uh, you know, The Origin of Races in 1962. Kuhn was a very prominent physical um, anthropologist. Uh, he was chair of the Penn Anthro Department for many, many years and a barely closeted active segregationist, um, but, and a believer in polygenesis, right, which is the idea that different racial groups uh, evolved two homo sapiens from different ancestral forms, right? Um, when Kuhn published uh, the summation of his life's, life's work, he was roundly attacked by the liberals in, in the physanthro world. And you can take that as kind of a marker of the completion of the shift, right? Um, so, so, so the shift- And to, uh, to go back to, to what you were saying a moment ago, I guess what you, yeah. I'm trying to, to follow the, the arc of the argument. And I guess what he's saying is that um, there's an ideological commitment to thinking of race as fundamental, and then it takes these different uh, forms, right. um, these different ideological uh, ways it sort of expresses itself in different moments. And so right. that was sort of the defeat of the most obvious classic uh, form of uh, uh, thinking of race as fundamental, which is biological, right? right? Which, which, right. which had right. really been quite dominant in American intellectual circles in the early 20th century, for example. Right. Yeah. Um, and then I guess this was the moment when successfully uh, the pushback against that, that notion had succeeded. Um, but then I guess your argument implies that the ideological commitment to race is going to drive, is going to lead to the appearance of a different kind of ontological form in which people try to express those racial differences or try to right. uh, reassert the importance of race. So, so how does that right. happen right. in the next phase? Right. Well, yeah, the modification I would make is is that it may not even be so much a commitment to the idea of race as a commitment to the idea of naturalized hierarchies, right? That 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 people are where they seem to be in the world because that's where they're they're they're, um, they're supposed to be, right? So, like in that sense, there's something kind of futile about it, even, right? Um, but so what happens after World War II? In, in particular, at least in the US uh, and in the social sciences, um, the, the work uh, uh, arguably <clears throat> that the race idea had, had done previously to, to, um, um, to root uh, the understandings of natural human difference someplace other than political economy, because from my perspective, that's always the goal, right? Is to root it someplace other than political economy and as a manifestation of a contemporary cl class hierarchies, kind of moves to culture, right? And we see this uh, it, in the 50s, like in the US, first in the emergence of the sort of culture of poverty idea, but then even in the invention uh, or the reinvention of economic inequality as poverty, right? So, so poverty, like if you read back to the late 50s and early 60s, and even the work of, of people who are on sort of my, my my side politically, like uh, Michael Harrington, there's a powerful uh, um, inclination to provide culturalist accounts of why people are poor, uh, and insofar as you know culturalism or, or culture lies or, or is understood to lie you know, outside political economy, then you've got 
like another version of an essentialist uh, what I mean, argument. Uh, and then the, and, and, and as, you know, by the late 60s, uh, you know, with Black Power and, and the emergence of the Chicano movement and, and the Puerto Rican uh, new movement for social justice, as those migrate you know, into you know, discourses that are based on culture and nationality, even with the connections to more or less uh, the romantic, uh, I mean, connections to third world uh, you know, anti-colonial insurgencies, mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa. Uh, uh, <laughs> well, it did the same kind of work, right? So, uh, so, so, so by, by the 80s or like into the 80s, but certainly, uh, you know, by the end of the Clinton or, or during and by the end of the Clinton administration, class and political economy have disappeared from American political discourse uh, or at least um, policy oriented discourse you know, almost entirely, right? And culture is what there is left for us to understand, you know, existing uh, or, or, or the discourse that's available for us to understand uh, um, um, existing inequalities, right? Um, and in the last, ooh, see, I think that something really big happens or has 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 happened since 2015, or or certainly after um, uh, the Great Crash. Um, and uh, um, as as uh, levels of, of of economic inequality in the U.S. have become greater, ha as the society has become more polarized economically since then, um, uh, the two main languages of response are from the right, um, what we can summarize a, a, as a reactionary nationalism, basically. And from the, you know, so that's what I would often talk about in terms of authoritarian populism, but versus terms of right. competition, right? We're talking about Donald Trump and so on. Right, 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 exactly. Like I, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. As a rule, and yes, I know you do, and and I take that point. I think it's correct. Like, uh, well, uh, I'm as a rule, uh, I tend to shy away from 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 identifying that as populist because corporate Democrats, uh, uh, what have used the label right, to apply to Bernie Sanders as 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 as, as, as a, well as to Trump, and this is also the way that what kind of that um, that consensualist academics in, in the American Academy, again, in, in the post-war era, uh, you tended to talk about uh, um, um, the populist, in, uh, populist insurgency at the end of the 19th century. But yeah, yeah, I mean, that's the thing there. Yeah, so I think I mean, it's sort of a little bit, uh, it's a side conversation, I suppose, but it's worth having for a second. I mean, the, mm -hmm, the, sure. the, the term populist is that, first of all, it's just in English has the really unfortunate happenstance that it that it refers to two distinct conceptual right. things That's right? Right. first there's the populist right. party of the late 19th and early 20th century right um and the second is a sort of political science concept about uh, uh a long-standing political science concept which has its conceptual origins right. in no, that's right. about right. the way in which certain politicians are uh, uh sort of in, in vocal rhetoric of standing for the whole of the right people right that's right right restrictions on the power and possible right and then right. the second is even the people who have the concept in mind that I usually have in mind when I talk about populist and that's mm -hmm. a concept, uh, you know, often just misapply it in the way that people right. often misapply right. the term fascist or the term... Right, no, that's uh, right. You know, but, right, there's all kinds of political terms that, that have negative valence and then obviously that often invites the uh, temptation of people to just use it in an inappropriate way for people right. they don't like, right? Yeah. So I think the concept of populism is important. Right. It's an important one, but I recognize that it's one that's fraught with many, uh, 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 with a lot of potential for for, right. for intellectual error or, or, or for political instrumentalization. Yeah, no, absolutely, man. And 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 by the way, I'm with you 100 percent on that, right? Like, like, yeah, I understand what you're right about as populists. Well, when you write about it, and I understand what Michael Lind writes about as populists when he writes about it, right? And and in a way, like the one punchline is that people should read more and and read more carefully, right? Because words don't have intrinsic meanings, right? So, uh, but anyway, uh, so that's a lapse into pedantry. But yeah, so I mean, that's on the one side. And then on the other side uh, is um, 
disparitarianism, right, as a standard of injustice, right? And, and as you know, I'm sure that this is a notion I've been on the warpath against for quite some time because there's nothing transformative uh, about um, correcting or addressing disparities by ascriptive or based on, based on ascriptive hierarchy or, or ideas of, of ascriptive difference. And from that perspective, sure, like if you're gonna have, have what I mean, even, you know, in a sort of um, half-baked Keynesian moment, like in American uh, new political history, right? Um, uh, um, addressing disparities as you know, disparate outcomes uh, seem seem like a reasonable, a reasonable and a small d. I mean, democratic thing to do. Um, it, it seemed less and less so as that has displaced completely. Um, uh, um, uh, uh, efforts to reduce economic inequality, and as and as the society has become more and more polarized, because or, you know, with respect like what to wealth and income, uh, because the model there is that a you know, it is that the society could be one in which one one percent of the population controls ninety five percent of the resources, and, and it would be just. Um, so long as 12% of the 1% were black and 14% were Hispanic or half women or whatever. And I mean, that kind of reminds me, uh, like I saw uh, Alistair McIntyre give a talk at Yale back in the 80s when he was you know, moving back from Lenin to Rome. Uh, and, uh, and someone asked him a question about his, his criteria for uh, you know, determining that, that, that a society is democratic. And his response was that, well, you can consider it uh, I mean, democratic. If if, if anyone, right, outside, uh, you, um, you, know, you know, the executive elite, it, um, is able to participate in making uh, pertinent political uh, decisions, and 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 whoever asked him the question, uh, you know, responded by saying, "Well, by that standard, South Africa would be a democracy," uh, and he said, "Well, yes, it would be because some people are able to." To I mean participate now. If you read the history of of national socialism, like you'll understand that well, I mean, Hitler was at the top, but there were other people who were able to you know, participate in some way or another. So, so I mean that's uh, but everything that's is democracy. Right, right, right. <laughs> well, there's there's a political science line, but nothing is a democracy. Uh, you know, which is more plausible, I think. Than right. than well, yeah, yeah, right, right, exactly. <laughs> um, so. So the sort of second incarnation of this ideological commitment to, to race is in this sort of cultural form. Mm -hmm. um, and you're starting to talk about the sort of ways in which that leads on the one side to the rise of something like Trump and to on the other side to the rise of something like an identity focused modern, modern left or something like that. Mm -hmm. right. um, this to me is something that I keep coming back to not just because I do think it's an important development in the world and not just because it affects a lot of the people I know and a lot of the institutions I live in, mm -hmm. um, but because it's intellectually, I think, the hardest to understand. You know, the far right rediscovers that they think of, uh, you know, certain groups as inferior. Right. Uh, that's worrying and it's shocking and it's important to fight against it, but there's nothing intellectually interesting or surprising about right. that. Right, no, uh, that's to right. To me, as somebody who grew up with communist grandparents, as a member mm -hmm. of the youth movement of the Social Democratic Party in Germany. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, what it was to be on the left was to be a kind of right. human universalist, which right. didn't deny the recognition of colonial injustices, right. didn't deny the right. recognition of the existence of racism in the midst of our society, right. but which always posited that the goal was something like workers of the world unite. The right. goal was something like, right. no, in no. the end, we should recognize that these differences uh, should be overcome and are not as important as the things that humans mm -hmm. share. Um, right. um, how is it that this has ceased to be the dominant intellectual mode of the left? How is it that a sort of proud embrace of the idea that uh, you know, somebody being white or Latino or black is really the most important thing about them or one of the absolutely mm -hmm. fundamental things about them. Right. Um, and that in fact, society would be better if people were more aware of these ethnic differences. Well, 
How right. does that happen on the left? Well, that's a very good, good, good question. And I'll start by um, expressing our, um, or how simpatico we are about this. Like my father was at a minimum mo moved in the orbit of the Communist Party, right? Uh, what I mean, during my youth and my mother was a Catholic worker, kind of Catholic, right? So, so I grew up the way you grew up and, and I grew up uh, to appreciate the enlightenment and not, not, not least because I suffered through 12 years of Catholic school, right, by contrast. <laughs> but so, yeah, I mean, like I've watched this happen over the last 40 years, right? Uh, and, and I mean, a simple answer or, or response is, you know, I, I mean, more like a quip, uh, is that it happened because um, it, 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 it appealed to the sensibilities of the ruling class, right? But, um, but, but more problematic, I think, is, well, so I guess I'd start by saying, and maybe I would take this transition that you described as evidence, but that the, but 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 I think a discussion has to begin from acknowledgement that there is no left in the U.S. and and hasn't been for quite some time. Now, I realize that in saying that, what what I'm actually uh, I'm stipulating is it it is that a left is what you, you and I grew up understanding a left to be. Right. Um, but through a process of, of semantic um, inflation and and in infiltration, right, like over the last four four decades, um, the um, um, uh, uh, what what it under what, what people generally understand to be a, a left has been, you know, once again, disconnected from from political economy and and linked to uh, new performances of identity, basically. Uh, um, I think that the, 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 that the dialectical connection here is, is the retreat of a working class politics and the retreat of a working class left, right? Which you can trace back to, to, to the purging of the AFL-CIO at the end of World War II. Uh, you know, what happened, um, you, know, what the, uh, you know, what the new left was and, and became and, and and the extent to which it 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 actually defined itself against um, a social democratic politics. I mean, for instance, uh, and pardon the parenthetical, but but part of the debate over how to shape the war on poverty in 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 in, in the Kennedy and Johnson administrations um, was you know, understood by participants, or at least those. Those those who understood themselves to be aligned with the new left, as uh, as a debate between ossified, bu bureaucratic, uh, and a uh, you know, mechanistic one size fits all um, uh, um, programs of of, 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 of of a macroeconomic intervention versus um, the um, emerging. Um, fascination with pursuit of authenticity, right? And, and the Ford Foundation was in the middle of this, right? And you, you can see like going through the debates and the documents, how the non-economic position came to be seen as the progressive one, where, 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 where the argument made by people like Walter Ruther you know, from the CIO, well, at that point, UAW, and, and A. Philip Randolph and others that, Basically, people were poor because they didn't have jobs that were good enough, uh, and what and didn't have money. So, so therefore, the way to fight fight poverty is, is through creating what opportunities for meaningful employment for people, and and that got castigated as the right wing position, where where this notion that and there's a bait and switch here, or like a sleight of hand that- So, so explain the debate yeah. to me because I'm not as, as familiar with it. So, right. uh, so the position that you're talking about is basically to say, look, the way to overcome poverty is to make sure that people who are poor, um, you know, with all of the cultural and so on consequences that it does have, right. um, get access to good jobs. And once right. they have access to good jobs, they're gonna be able to get out of poverty and also some of the cultural things we might be worried about uh, or people at the time were worried about, like right. say single mothers or whatever, um, right. are going to be 
overcome? And, and that became right. the right wing position. What became the left wing position? Or what was the other poll in that debate? Right. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Well, the other poll was, and here's a sleight of hand, that people were poor uh, because they lacked a sense of personal capacity. Um, so, so that, so like this was the community, this, the, what well, this was the foundation of the community mobilization approach to finding poverty. So what the idea is, is that you organize the poor to uh, act on their own behalf and somehow magically that would turn into the end of poverty, right? Um, and nobody or hardly anyone re recognized that at, at the time in, in the terms in which I'm describing it now, right? Um, but, but in effect, um, the, the, the um, psychologistic understanding of, of the roots of poverty is, is what became part of the basis of, or at least it reflected but what, what was becoming part of the basis of the new left's understanding of radicalism. Right. And I can't tell you how how many frustrating meetings I attended when I was in college of people thinking the point of politics was to express themselves and to realize their 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 you know, deeper identities and aspirations. So 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 that was part of or that's one tributary that flowed into this great river that we're talking about right, right today. Um, and then in the mid to late 80s, right, uh, uh, in the academy in, in particular, just as um, the newer I mean, disciplines of you know, black studies and, and f feminist studies, et cetera, that, that had emerged with, um, with, with a, I wouldn't say taint, but with, with an aura of, uh, of ersatz politics about them, right? Or, uh, or of extramural right, political uh, meaning about them. Just as they were becoming you know, institutionalized as sort of as, as 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 solidly respected fields of study in 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 the elite academy, um, you, you got a funny kind of um, so so like they were under internal pressure or, or scholars in those fields were under internal pressure themselves to combine their what we might call the social service I mean justifications for their existence with with you know, demonstrations of high intellectuality, right? Um, so at that moment, uh, you know, we get um, another it, you know, infusion of French theory. Uh, and we also get a particular kind of American appropriation of cultural studies you know, on a British model. Uh, and they come together like in a way that you know, reinforces identitarianism. And, and my colleague then and friend, uh, what I'm James Scott, and his work on the hidden transcripts of, 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 of the oppressed gets appropriated by people in those disciplines to make claims about how the truth of you know, women, Blacks, Hispanics, like whatever, can never be known unless you, 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 you do the deep, you know, almost strousing. In fact, I compared it. <laughs> yeah, that compared it like um, to, you know, to Straussianism in a book. Um, sort of mystified understanding of like deep hidden meanings that have to, you know, that can only be reached through, through, through an elaborate and an esoteric hermeneutic, which also carries with it um, 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 a race reductionist and identitarian component in, in the sense that there's like at least a substantive argument that's packed into that, that you know, only the black woman can really get access to the esoteric um, 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 in interpretation of the state of the black black woman. You you can see how this becomes also a career imperative, and then you kind of stir stir into the mix the emergence of the notion of the public intellectual at the end of the '80s and the beginning of the '90s. And like to this, my old friend and comrade uh, uh, Russell Jacoby was an unintended contributor, uh, but because he invented the notion, but but then it gets taken up uh, in the identitarian I mean, discourses of these scholars. Uh, and then it goes back and forth between the university and, and uh, that's, practical life. That's fascinating. I'd never thought of the idea of 
uh, what some people call situated knowledge, uh, mm -hmm. what often today is called standpoint epistemology, right. as having it, one of its roots in the work of James Scott, whom I also greatly admire. As a right, yeah, me too. And that, that I invite listeners to, to go back to. He has the wonderful, I don't know if we, we've heard this, um, uh, you know, he's now, I believe, in his 80s. Right. And he has uh, the, the modest uh, endeavor in his 80s, not just to return to speaking um, uh, uh, Burmese at a very high uh, mm -hmm. level, uh, which mm -hmm. was something he started to do in his 20s, but to, right. to write a first person plural history of the Ayagadi River. Oh my um, God! Huh. Uh, uh, so in the wee form, spanning you wow. know four thousand or five thousand years, wow. which which is which is uh, you know I, I when when I ended that conversation, I thought my only hope in life is that when I'm in my eighties, I I have right. the intellectual enthusiasm and the hell right. to, yep. to to be excited about an intellectual project like that. But um, uh, mm -hmm. you use the term race reductionism, which is one of the phrases that 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 that, that you're well known for. Mm -hmm. What is race reductionism and, and why should we be worried about race reduction? Right. Yeah, well, I, well, it's funny. I give my son credit for for, you know, for the term uh, and, and, and it's in part, but, but of course, um, a reversal. Another life ambition, by the way, is to have a child with whom one has as fruitful intellectual collaboration <laughs> as you can have. <laughs> well, it's better to be lucky than good. <laughs> yeah, and I'm pleased to have him as a colleague. And also as a son, but but um, um, uh, on 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 one level, right? Like on a rhetorical level, it's you know, obviously a you know, a reversal of the class reductionism charge that people levy at the likes of us, right? Uh, but but there's an organic foundation for the term, which is that look so. Um, I just completed like an essay, um, well, a draft of an essay about this issue last night. But that it, so like if you be, start out from an, from from assumptions like um, that, like the assumption that um, that 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 the black experience in North America, right, has been uniformly defined by Racism, what white supremacy, and um, and even like a sort of demon theory of a trans uh, 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 of a transcendent anti-blackness that has animated the history of the entire world. What that means is it, it, it is that you're reducing everything that has to do with Black Americans' experience to 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 to, to their racial classification, and we see that now. For instance, um, like what well, this just popped into my head because I quoted it, but. Uh, shortly after the 2016 presidential campaign, or maybe it was a little later, it might have been uh, in uh, 2018, uh, um, you know, the MSNBC host, who I just described as a tribune of ne neoliberal anti-racism, uh, uh, you know, jo jo Joanne Reed, in, 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 in an interview with Trevor Noah on uh, The Daily Show, um, just declared that black people don't have an interest in stuff like free public higher education or Medicare for all, right? Or, you know, a, a 15 dollar an hour wage or employment security or what access to, 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 to a secure and dignified retirement. You know, what black people want is a reckoning as they call it and to have the racial conversation. Uh, and that can only work, first of all, if, 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 if others are at all prepared to accept her you know, at, as a ventriloquist of 46 million black people, right? Um, but also if, if people are accepting or are prepared to accept, including her, by the way, um, you know, the, the, the premise that, that like every other feature of the lives of any black person is subordinate to their racial classification and to an issue agenda that purportedly can be read out from the racial classification. That, that seems like a textbook explanation of, of race reductionism to me. And I think that's, that, that's a mindset that dominates um, current identity politics. Um, so what would a 
healthy treatment of race look like in contemporary American life? Um, you know, I'm struck by the fact that in the United States, um, even in terms of descriptive statistics, mm -hmm. people often don't control for class, right? No, so right. They say, no that's no, right. Uh, uh, you know, really stupid example. Uh, OK, Cupid used to the dating site, which, you know, mm -hmm. once upon a time was dominant. Now I think it's very small. Um, uh, you know, had this blog and they showed the percentage of respondents that various, uh, that members of various demographic groups got. Mm -hmm. And among women, black women got the fewest responses. Um, okay. And that was read as straightforwardly an expression of racism, right. when presumably a lot of what's going on in these dating sites is all kinds of subtle class clues. Right. Um, and one of the things that drove that is that probably statistically the average black, us black user was less affluent because the average right. African-American in the United States is still less affluent, right? right. Um, right. Now, on the other hand, um, I, I was just in, in France for a while, and there I often get the response when I talk about any kind of form of racial injustice or something like that of, well, mm -hmm. just about class. Right. Uh, right. And, and I, I agree that class plays a large element right. in it, but, sure. but, but, but I wouldn't want to deny that on top of class, there are also forms of racial discrimination. Sure. There are also forms of prejudices. There's some reasonably convincing studies where people send in CVs with right. uh, different names, for example, and it turns yep. out the names that the mark uh, a minority group in most countries um, get fewer invitations right. to interview than the names that have the locally dominant, uh, you know, that are called Thomas Smith or right. Jean Francois, whatever, right? <laughs> right. Um, right. Uh, so, so how do we talk about this in a subtle yeah. way, which avoids what I do think often happens in the States, which is mm -hmm. race reductionism, mm -hmm. uh, but also what I think in some of the other contexts, like in, like in France, can right. happen. Yeah, absolutely. Reductionism right. or, or denial of the right. importance of race. Right. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. I mean, and look, like in addition to stuff like the Cupid site, most medical and public health uh, in the research doesn't collect data by by class so race is a proxy so 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 like researchers and i've written about this too but but and the researchers often use race as a proxy for class which you know does what what which does the work that it does well see I, yeah i mean here's how i've come to think about um you know the relation right like I've, um and and frankly but I came into politics in, a, in, in the mid 1960s and, and, and was part of sections of the left from the end of the 60s forward um, that spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to, you know, how to deal with the so-called race, race class dichotomy, which is an issue going back in the American left to before the first world war. Um, and, uh, and here's what I've come to, right? That race is best understood as a species of a genus of ideologies of, of, of ascriptive hierarchy that do that function in class societies, but we'll just take capitalism for the moment, um, to, um, to equilibrate the hierarchy or to sustain the hierarchy by reading it into nature, right? So in the feudal era, peasants were peasants because because they were supposed to be peasants or God made them peasants or whatever, right? Um, in, and, and, and for much of the history of the West, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, and the women were subordinate because they were by nature subordinate and so forth and so on. And race does that work and has always done that work and race evolved to do that work. And to be moreover, um, the race in particular is a notion that given its own natural history at, you know, as an ideology uh, is inseparable. Well, I wouldn't say it's inseparable. Um, it, it emerged within and along with and, and, and functional to, and, and I don't mean to sound, sound so much like a functionalist, this is sort of a shorthand, uh, but I'm talking about evolution over a long, long time, um, but functional to capitalist class processes. Right. I mean, going back to colonial, right? I mean, Virginia. So my colleague Barbara Fields, uh, for 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 a number of years, did you know did, did an exercise with you know with her Columbia undergrads, 
and she would ask the students to show hands if, if they were sitting to somebody of the same race or of a different race, right? But whichever, I always get it confused. And then she would ask them to show hands if they were sitting next to someone who looked exactly like themselves. And her point was that Homo sapiens vary along more dimensions than you can shake a stick at, right? Uh, yeah, but only some of them right, become the basis for race ideology. And it just so happened that those that became the basis for race you know, ideology were the populations that needed to be contained, right? Um, so from that perspective, um, the, to me, the race versus class uh, uh, I mean, debate is like mis, mis, misformulated. Um, and, and the issue would be more like um, trying to investigate the work that race and, and, and comparable ideologies, because I do see, see race as one point on an indifference curve, right, of, 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 of discourses of, 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 of ascriptive difference. And what that means, among other things, by the way, is that I blanch at, at, at constructs like you know, race is our original sin, it's a national disease, and all that kind of stuff. Because yes, uh, American racism has a particular horror, but I'll tell you, and this is another anecdote, so I realize I'm going all around before I get to the end of the sentence. Um, yeah, this past summer, um, I, I saw a documentary on the Vietnamese American population in the city of New Orleans. Uh, and it was part of um, you know, the annual film festival. And what, and what one of my nieces is, in fact, yeah, yeah, what, what, what one of my nieces is, in fact, featured right in the documentary, right? But before the film started, uh, there was a, um, a generic um, short video of what I understand now is called the land acknowledgement, right? Uh, and it was like a video of the Mississippi River and a boat in it, but the voiceover is giving credit to all of the uh, or, or the multiple Native American populations who had lived in, in the area, uh, like going back to before uh, the 18th century, um, the African slaves, uh, you know, other Blacks, this, that, and the other. Um, and I mentioned this to my son the next morning, uh, and he asked asked the question that was what that that was on my mind what when I watched this thing which was was there any reference to the 20,000 plus Irish uh, immigrants who died digging the new basin canal in the city in the 1830s and of course there was none right because uh, you know for obvious reasons so, so my point about that is that racism is a particular horror Right, there's no question about that. Right, um, it's and 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 it's a horror. And this is, uh, I think, another problem. And I realize this is yet another digression off the previous two. But I mean, this is another thing that's always disturbed me ab about those people who want to insist that the Holocaust was sacrosanct as at, 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 as a sweet generous um, form of oppression, because that just seems to me to let it off the hook. Because in fact. Uh, in 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 both cases, that uh, the racism and 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 a new world anti-black uh, uh, racism or like colonial um, what racism are first of all species of the same genus, um, and there are other forms forms of oppression and exploitation that are that if it if if it's going to be about a um, you know, a discussion of what deserves moral opprobrium, th then I think they all do like in an equal way. And I think that the sanctimonious uh, you know, discourse about the singularity of, of the racism kind of gets in the way both of understanding what it was, how, how it emerged, and what the links are between then, th then and now. And one last point, 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 point about that, I want to give props to um, a legal historian, Robert Steinfeld, who's 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 done really great work on the origins of the idea of free labor, right? Like in in uh, mainly in the U.S. and the U.K. And what one of the points he makes early on is that you know despite the moralistic discourse, what when you look historically, 
slavery in the new world is not the anomaly that needs to be explained, right? I mean, till into the 19th century, the vast majority of 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 all labor had been bound in some way, or 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 another. The thing that needs to be explained is the emergence of the modern idea of free labor in the 19th century. So I don't know. Like I think I've gone all the way around Robin Hood's barn again. But but but, but did I glancingly at least? Um, what let me respond to the question you 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 posed. I, no, absolutely. I think I think that was, that was incredibly helpful. There's a million details I would love to double click on, but um, but I want to make sure that that we talk a little bit about your latest book as well, mm -hmm. uh, which is about uh, yeah, I'd like that one particular uh, uh, form that racial discrimination took in the United States, which is mm -hmm. Crow. Um, what sort of what? How would you describe? Uh, the nature of Jim Crow um, and how does that differ from what uh, you know our listeners may may assume? Mm, okay, yeah, good. Um, to me, um, what, what the Jim Crow order was first of all, it it was historically specific. <clears throat> um, um, I've I've often said to my classes that all four of my grandparents were sentient beings, right? They fully become what I'm homo sapiens. Uh, and, and, and probably a couple of them were adults already by the time that, that the system was consolidated, right? In, in the years around the first world war. And its back was broken by the time I, you know, I, I was 18 years old. So that's, uh, it, it was not much more than a 60 year system. And, and, and it was, you know, not any fun, right? For those 60 years, but it began and and it ended, right? Um, and I think the system emerged um, as um, as a response to a particular problem that was experienced by the well, a couple of different problems actually um, that that were experienced by the southern um, the political and economic dominant class, right? Merchant, planter, capitalist class. Um, one of the problems, you know, was the objective problem of of uh, of uh, uh, of accumulation, right? Just because of the nature of the southern economy toward uh, the end of the nineteenth century. Yeah, but the other was, and I mean, the planters. What's the, what, uh, what's the problem of accumulation? Oh, sorry. Uh, well, uh, like beginning around uh, uh, um, what around eighteen eighty, there was a long term, uh, um, uh, you know, depression in. In, in cotton economy, right? So, uh, and and planters in particular had been cash strapped since the treasonous insurrection of 1861, 1865, and were in, 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 in increasingly in, in a hock to Northern financiers, right? So that's kind of the foundation for one um, node in the lost cause, uh, um, um, but a count that sort of sees the tattered South as being a colonial subject of the you know North, but so 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 there was that issue. Um, but since emancipation, um, planters had been uh, you know it seemed to me on in the retrospect maybe unnaturally concerned about the possibilities of cross racial alliance between poor whites and and poor and, and working class whites and black freedmen, especially after the 15th amendment uh, in you know, enfranchised black, black men. But there were enough examples of, 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 of that insurgent alliance um, being effective right between 1868 and, and, uh, and 1890 uh, to justify the fear, right? And then in the early 1890s, blacks and whites aligned in the populist movement, right? Uh, and in, in 1892 and again in 1896, um, a populist, a populist re, uh, the Republican fusion alliance won, won statewide office like in North Carolina and, and was reelected in 1896. Um, so after um, the ruling class, call it, just call the dog by his right name, uh, succeeded in suppressing the populist in, in insurgency. 
uh, there, there was a concerted move you know, to reassert dominant class power across the board. The first step of which was disfranchisement, and and like more more than you know, ninety percent of, of of blacks were disfranchised. And depending on which state you were in, up to a quarter to a third third, third of whites. I mean, a, what a number that sticks out in my mind is that in the eighteen ninety six presidential election more than 100,000 Blacks voted in the state of Louisiana in, in the 1904 election, fewer than 1,000 voted, right? Uh, and then disfranchisement then like became the pretext for imposition of, 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 of a political, economic, social, and cultural order based, based explicitly on codified what white supremacy. And that's what the Jim Crow order was. And so, uh, I, I take it that part of the project of this book is revisionary in certain ways, that you want to uh, change how we think about what life under Jim Crow was like or what the nature of Jim Crow was. So, right. so tell us more about what Jim Crow meant for primarily its victims and, and, and how you think we, we misunderstand the nature of it at times. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I'll try. I mean, um, so look, at, you know, as is normally the case, right? People who um, are on uh, the victimized end, end of, of an oppressive system, um, to some extent, will um, experience it as everyday life, right? As the natural order of things. And you make adaptations, right? You find ways to, to, um, um, to um, you know, define um, um, dignity, right? roots to personal what i mean dignity or I mean, security or whatever so i mean there's that um so one facet of the sort of commonsensical understanding um to correct as it were it is that it wasn't like what my son uh, often refers to as white people's permanent sadism camp right um um it it was also like an and an order that was imposed on everyone Right on on whites as well as blacks, and everyone had to figure out ways, um, especially in, in the domains of of life that weren't explicitly re regulated by you know statute, right? Um, about how to um, accommodate themselves to it, right? Um, there, um, um, it 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 was as oppressive systems typically are if they survive for any length of time, um, malleable and, and evolving right, internally on its own, right? Um, so, um, but frankly, like the, you know, the first order of correction for me, it, it is that most Americans, even most students, um, tend to think of that period in, in, in in American history, or for that matter, any other, as like a blur of the you know, un, you know, of the unbroken uh, bad old days, right, uh, or bad old timey times, where slavery and like Jim Crow are like indistinguishable; they're the same thing. And all of a sudden, something happened, or or I mean, didn't happen. And this is another problem I'd like to correct, which is, and I've had back and forth with people about this, like on podcasts too, like. Well, but there are people who want it, who can't believe that I'm contending that that the Jim Crow order was finite, right? Uh, or or, you know, or they was defeated. Um, and the reason that that's the case is, and this is um, what what another um, anecdote that I'm sure this person will be tired of hearing, but uh, in the fall of 2017, I think it was, like I taught. Uh, for the first time in a long time, uh, um, a grad course on Black American political thought. And it was really uh, more of, of a bibliography course than a research course. So the readings were massive. And what one of the students who, who was first year, and I guess probably first semester, a you know, political theory student with, with, who hadn't been steeped in this kind of stuff, uh, led a you know, discussion of readings, a, a very large mat, massive readings from like the mid thirties to the mid forties with, with a bunch of prominent authors. And when she began her comments you know, to lead the discussion, she said, 
what, well, the first thing that struck me, what was it of, of, of all these people, no one talked about the need to combat racism, right? Uh, th but they were all focused on you know, specific programs and policies to fight against and, and in specific programs and policies to fight for. They all also understood that, it, that an indispensable key to improving the conditions of black Americans was to pursue what you and I would call like a social democratic agenda, right? And that's been lost also, right? So like one of the problems th that I wanna correct is, or I'd like to do my little bit to correct, right? I'm not that arrogant, um, is this tendency to reduce politics or thinking about race purely to attitudes, right? I mean, Yes, you, you can see something that you can call racism, but racism doesn't do anything, right? It's people and institutions that do anything. And then that opens up, and see so that approach opens up to other totally unnecessary, right? And useless debates like, is, is X action racist? Is X idea racist? Which isn't the point, right? So that's one of the things I had, that, 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 that's one of the larger objectives I had in mind with, with, with the book. And, and I'll say also that I think it, um, I think the narrative you know, reflects the sensibility that sort of drew me to the Frankfurt School in, in, in the early 70s. And it's, and, and it's the inclination to look for, um, you know, like in cellular um, uh, uh, um, domains, um, you know, to look for um, the, uh, the definite or the work of the definitive features like of the social order, right? Uh, whether like in mass culture or whatever. So, th th so, so my secret's out, that's what I was up to. Um, so, so that nicely connects um, uh, your conceptual work, your philosophical work, your historical work to, to, to the question I now have, which is what the implication is about the kinds of policies or kinds of political actions we should pursue Mm -hmm. to overcome the injustices that obviously still structure the United States. Um, right. so, so what do you think the implications are of uh, being on the guard against race reductionism, mm -hmm. recognizing that a, a fight against the abstract notion of racism isn't as important as a fight against the actual uh, injustices uh, structured across class and racial lines that we mm -hmm. experience today? What does all of that mean for the kinds of political action that you would like listeners to this podcast to take? Oh, good. Okay. Uh, well, um, so I published an article last last summer in Nancy called called the whole uh, the whole country is the Reichstag, uh, and the point of that article is it is and this connects with something else I've been saying for 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 a while based based on reading and thinking not you know uh, I mean not just about the U.S. but but about the responses to what I think is a crisis in neoliberalism that's more global. And, and that is, um, I put it often in the form of a question, what, 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 what if we've gotten to a point where ne neoliberalism can no longer you know, deliver enough to enough of the population to maintain its uh, legitimacy as a nominally I mean, democratic order? Well, then it seems like we're at, uh, like we may be at um, a T, uh, what an intersection where that there are only two directions to go and, and I'm straight ahead isn't one of them. Uh, you know, the right is the right, right? It's like the real danger, I think, of authoritarian or fascist, I'm not going to quibble, um, takeover of one sort or or another, right, in the United States. I'm, I'm not going to quibble um, what between the ballot box and, and putsch, and they often come together anyway. Um, and the other um, the direction is moving in something like a more social democratic, what up? Uh, uh, what I mean, direction that connects pu public policy to satisfying, you know, working people's real needs. Um, from that perspective, like the Biden administration, the eh, first year looked looked better than I'd hoped, right? I mean, knowing Biden, but it's kind of an interesting moment when, when on domestic policy, um, the left wing of the Biden administration is. It is a condensed around Brian Dees and, and, and BlackRock. And on the foreign policy dimension, like the left wing of the administration seems to be John Mearsheimer. Um, so 
so things don't look great. But in, but in that context, I want to make a plug because we've uh, begun a podcast called the Class Matters Podcast. Uh, and we have two issues in the can and we're trying to work on the third one now. And its tagline is, what would the country look like if it were governed by and for the working class? And that's where I think uh, you know, the central focus of, of, of our politics needs to be. That's why I don't go to Brooklyn anymore, except to see my old friend, Howard Levy from the anti-war movement, like who lives there. Uh, I mean, that's why I, you know, I don't really have anything to do with, you know, with the intellectual left or, or like any of that stuff, because pressingly, but also, you, you know, when you take the foot off the throttle, like the most important thing, thing, thing for us to do is to try to build build a political movement, um, which which has to be built from the ground up, right? There's no, but but I, but I mean I know Americans and 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 especially younger ones really want shortcuts, but there's, but I don't think there's any way around rebuilding um, a, a working class based left in this country of the sort that you and I grew up understanding, um, what, what what the left to be. So as a final question, let me ventriloquate mm -hmm. a, a conservative response or criticism that, that, that or pushback that you might get to, to these ideas. I mean, we've talked a lot sure. about uh, your differences with sort of a predominant strain of the left. Mm -hmm. um, and it goes back, I think, to that debate about the culture of poverty. I, I was mm -hmm. really struck with a conversation I had with a conservative who said, look, when we talked about of things like the culture of poverty in the 60s and 70s, this was uh, portrayed as being racist or being a sort of coded set of attacks on black people. But what's actually happened is that, uh, you know, the dissolution of family structures and all of the other kinds of things that they're worried about first struck African-Americans, mm -hmm. uh, but a decade or two later struck right. uh, white people. Um, right. And actually uh, all of the kinds of concerns that uh, we in quotation marks expressed about the evolution of Black American culture mm -hmm. was simply the vanguard of what ended ha up happening right. in uh, working class white communities in Appalachia, right. in the Middle West, in all kinds of places uh, in the country. Right. They follow from that that actually a, a key way of fighting against that is, in fact, uh, invocations of personal responsibility or, or right. forms of cultural reform and so on. So what right. do you think is, is wrong about, about that story? Okay, well, I'll say three things. First, when Jeff Bezos shows some personal responsibility, then, the, uh, what, then, the, the, then I'll look for it from, you know, from an unemployed mine worker. Uh, <laughs> second, um, I, I think conservatives who, who make that argument, and I've certainly heard it and read it too, are first of all being you know, disingenuous about what they were doing in, in the 60s and 70s, um, especially considering that the economic policy re regime that they generated and endorsed and that the, and that the corporate Dems followed uh, has led to, to increased Im immiseration among what, uh, 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 all, all sorts of working people. Uh, and there's nothing surprising right, about um, the fact that the Putative behaviors, and so much of that is often f fantasies of of the interpreter's mind, right? That are just so stories that are extrapolated from census tract level data, right? Um, but 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 it 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 shouldn't be a surprise that as immiseration spreads, that then these other problems are going to spread, right? Um, and I'd say also. Um, that the um, that personal responsibility is ne is uh, not the answer. I go back to the Bezos comment, right? I mean, um, uh, 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 what 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 should have been happening, right? It was certainly not what I mean, not the retreat of the social state over like the eighties and nineties, but as but at, you know, uh, you know, but as economic transition occurred, and it didn't just occur, like it was actively in, in, encouraged and, and supported by the state at all levels, uh, then supports should, should have been built in um, to, to accommodate people's transitions. Like this is just one tiny instance. Uh, like the labor movement in uh, New Jersey, um, 
coming from the Industrial U Union Council, which was the last vestige of a separate CIO but, um, um, body in, in the AFL-CIO. But the Industrial Union Council in the 80s and early 90s crafted you know, what they call the job destruction penalty law, which would have in, in, imposed a fine on every firm with, with 100 or more em, employees that, that left uh, it's a it's a lo location like in pursuit of cheaper wages or whatever. Um, find them um, what a significant sum plus, uh, and you required that they pay what what uh, yeah I mean a different sum per laid off worker to the community to like defray the cost what well, the cost of dislocation. Pursuit of that kind of industrial policy right at the federal level uh, would, would amount to altering the market incentives, right? That the people who were into market incentives like to talk about. And so, I mean, this is the kind of social democratic approach that could have been taken, that should have been taken to, 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 to fighting poverty in the first place. So I think as, as, as in so many other domains, I think the right's just full of shit right in that argument. <laughs> Well, on that uh, concise note, uh, <laughs> thanks for coming on the podcast. Oh, thanks very much for having me.